Hello there, and welcome to class. This, uh, this is going to be very, very interesting as we move forward for the rest of the semester, uh, trying to get the, the schedule to work and trying to keep everything moving forward. But more importantly, trying to create an environment where you can feel, uh, where you can feel the Lord's love for you and, and heavenly light shining on you as, as things are very uncertain and it's hard. So just know that we're praying for you and hope that you're, you're keeping your head above water as we move forward. Please reach out via email directly, tyler underscore griffin at byu.edu. If you have any special needs or, or concerns or things that you want to chat about or set up a time that we can talk face to face, we can do that. We, we need to be here for you. So bless you as you move forward. I want to begin today's lesson letting you know we're going to be covering two lessons in one. So this is going to be a little longer than, than typical. And uh, I'm sorry about that, but in order to be able to make up time, that's what we have to do. So let me take you here. If you haven't seen this, just to set the stage, the April enzyme, so the enzyme that's coming out right away, and you can get it online for free. The lead article is from President Nelson. It's called uh, The Future of the Church, Preparing the World for the Savior's Second Coming. You'll notice he says, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is preparing the world for the day when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. I wanted to show you a couple of lines here towards the end he, that ties in beautifully with today's lesson block. Do whatever it takes to strengthen your faith in Jesus Christ by increasing your understanding of the doctrine taught in his restored church and by relentlessly seeking truth. Anchored in pure doctrine, you will be able to step forward with faith and dogged persistence and cheerfully do all that lies in your power to fulfill the purposes of the Lord. Now notice this. You will have days when you will be discouraged, so pray for courage not to give up. Sadly, some who you thought were your friends will betray you, and some things will simply seem unfair. However, I promise you that as you follow Jesus Christ, you will find sustained peace and true joy as you keep your covenants with increasing precision. And as you defend the church and kingdom of God on the earth today, the Lord will bless you with strength and wisdom to accomplish what only members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints can accomplish. It's a pretty powerful uh, promise to us to begin. Now, we're going to be covering just little teeny excerpts out of the, the book of Helaman, as well as out of the first few chapters of 3rd Nephi. So, uh, turn to Helaman chapter 5, because you're hopefully taking notes in your scriptures. We're going to pick it up in verse 12, but before we get there, just to set the stage, you need to understand some background that's gone on here. At the end of the war chapters, at the end of Alma 62, when we, we finished the war, chapter 63 contains lots of migrations where people leave the land of Zarahemla and they all go north. <clears throat> they all flee northward. Hagoth builds ships in the West Sea near the land Bountiful, near the narrow neck of land, and he launches that ship and goes north. It comes back, they build more ships, they all leave, and then they don't hear from them again. Uh, then in Helaman chapter 3, you get major migrations, thousands of people, they're all leaving and they're all going north. And that creates this instability, this this realm of question for those who stay behind in Zarahemla. Life is different for them. They know that, that there are struggles ahead, and they don't quite know how to handle them. In Helaman chapter 5, you get uh, Helaman sitting down with his two sons, Nephi and Lehi, and he has this beautiful father-to-sons discussion with them, and 
I, you could spend tons of time in just this, this section of these verses, but we're going to focus in on one verse only. I want you to notice some things here because of how relevant they are to us today, right now, with what's going on in the world around us. And now, my sons, remember, remember that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that ye must build your foundation. Did you notice some things here? Notice that uh, Helaman gave you three titles, three roles for Jesus. The Redeemer, the Christ, the Son of God. It's upon him that we must build our foundation. Why? That when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds. Notice Helaman didn't say if the devil shall send forth his mighty winds. He's not trying to be overly dramatic with his sons. He's not trying to scare them to death. He's trying to prepare them. The fact is the devil will send forth mighty winds. And if you're built on that foundation, then when that happens, yea, his shafts in the whirlwinds, yea, when all his hail and his mighty storm shall beat upon you. Once again, it's coming at you in three. The mighty winds, shafts in the whirlwind, hail and mighty storm beat upon you. All of those things, if you look at them, they're really strong. They're really powerful. They're extremely destructive, but they're all temporary. They don't last forever. They don't keep going. They, they come, they rage, and then they pass. Notice if we're built upon the rock of our Redeemer, those powers that the devil is using shall have no power over you to drag you down to the gulf of misery and endless woe. Notice the word drag. That's always what's associated with Satan. He drags people down to the gulf of misery and endless woe. People don't walk into hell. The closer they get to it, the more they realize, I don't want to go there. But by then, he's, he's got them, so to speak. But notice None of those things will have power over you to drag you down because of the rock upon which ye are built, which is a sure foundation, a foundation whereon if men build, they cannot fall. So you'll notice the winds up above, when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds, and when all his hail and his mighty storm shall beat upon you. It's not a matter of if, it's just when. But you'll notice you do have an option down here. You don't have to build upon the rock of Christ, the Redeemer. It's your choice. But if we build upon him, then we cannot fall. Even if, even if society and culture around us seems to be falling and struggling, if things seem to be falling apart in our family, in our personal lives, if we'll stay rooted in Christ, we cannot fall. Um, and I just want to, I want to mention here, the best time to build upon the foundation of Christ, to build our foundation upon the rock of the Redeemer, is not in the middle of the major, major storm. Now, it's better to do that than to not try, but what's even better is if you can constantly be working on building that relationship with, with heaven, uh, through Christ, the Son of God so that you can weather these storms. Uh, based on what President Nelson said, there, there are stormy days ahead, and we're going to need to be rooted firmly in the rock of our Redeemer. So, Nephi and Lehi then go out on this mission to the Lamanites, and they actually have miraculous experiences, and the majority of the Lamanites get converted. So for the first time in the Book of Mormon, the Lamanite righteousness exceeds that of Nephite righteousness. And it's quite remarkable. Then in chapter 6, those righteous Lamanites start to preach to the wicked Nephites. And uh, we, we get introduced to this interesting concept in the Book of Mormon that, that keeps showing up. President Ezra Taft Benson talked about it quite a bit when he was the prophet about the subject of pride and the pride cycle 
that occurs in the Book of Mormon. If you want to turn to Helaman chapter 6, you could write these, these elements in the margin of page 383, kind of draw, if you would like, a pride cycle around the, the borders of those words. Uh, let me just walk you through really quickly. There are a lot of ways that you can visualize the pride cycle. I just want to show you one. This is, this is one way to look at it. It all begins with prosperity, right? We, we get lots of, uh, lots of possessions, lots of peace and prosperity. And what does that tend to do? For a natural man and a natural woman, it tends to lead us to pride, feelings of, of this internal sense of pride, which President Benson said is enmity towards God and love towards things of the world and things of the flesh. Pride is the gateway sin. It leads us to commit further sins and do further wrongs. Sin always leads to destruction. It may not come in the, in the moment of sin. It usually doesn't. It usually takes some time to plant seeds and then have them grow up. And if you plant sin seeds, they grow up to destruction. And when you experience enough destruction, it leads you to the bottom part of the cycle, which is sorrow, where you're lamenting, you, you feel horrible about where you are, which then leads to humility. Humility will lead you to turn to God in repentance and to try to turn your life more towards him and less towards the world, which then leads to him blessing you, which then leads to greater prosperity. Now you'll notice on here these eight elements You'll notice that as you look across the screen from each element, whatever's opposite is literally that. It's an opposite. Pride is the opposite of humility. Prosperity is the opposite of sorrow. In this case, blessings, destruction, repentance, sin, so on and so forth. Now, here's the problem. You look at this pride cycle, and what, what it is is it's basically a terrestrial cycle. You you have people who are good and then bad, and then good and then bad, and then good and then bad. In the book of Helaman, starting with chapter six, it becomes like a, a Ferris wheel. They're just going around and around and around. And in a couple of these chapters, you're gonna see them do like two and a half, three cycles in one chapter. It's just remarkable. And yet this book was written for our day. So I don't think that this was given to us so that we could mock or make fun of the, the Nephites and the Lamanites, but rather look in the mirror and see God speaking to us saying, can you, can you fix this? Now, later on in the book, after fourth Nephi in the time of Mormon, what you're going to find is this. The people end up in this destructive phase of the pride cycle which leads them to intense sorrow. And instead of them being humble by that, they actually do something different. They become more prideful, which leads to deeper sin, worse destruction, and more intense sorrow. And instead of repenting and being, or instead of being humble and repenting, they just get more angry at God they sin even worse and commit greater whoredoms. They're destroyed even further until it becomes this spiral downward. You can picture this, this cycle going into your screen there, leading down, 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 until they're completely destroyed, this entire Lamanite nation, or this entire Nephite nation by the Lamanites in Mormon chapter 6. And it's, it's pretty sad. Now, what is our option? Our, we don't have to be a, a, a victim to the telestial cycle that leads us to ultimate destruction. What we can do instead is say, hey, I want to resist not just the telestial cycle, but the terrestrial cycle. I want something better, which means we have to make a choice when we're at the peak of the cycle up there at prosperity. We have to reject pride. We have to figure out a way individually and collectively to stop seeing ourselves as, as better than everybody else or, or not needing God. 
we have to reject that, which then leads us in a spirit of humility to say, Lord, I am so grateful for this prosperity that, you, that thou hast given me. I didn't deserve it. Help me know what you want me to do with it, which leads us to greater layers of repentance, which leads us to more blessings from him and higher prosperity. And as we get higher prosperity, it deepens that cycle of humility where we become even more meek, more humble, more submissive. Not my will, but thine be done. I want to be an instrument in thy hands, Lord. Teach me, lift me, use me as an instrument to bless other people. And that becomes a spiral staircase coming out of your screen and, and going heavenward that it can keep uh, spiraling forever upward, making these other elements on the pride cycle not even an issue because we're not going there. We're not doing that. So there's your choice. You can either choose the terrestrial cycle or you can choose that destructive telestial cycle to get more and more and more angry at God and more prideful and commit further and further sins. Or you can choose to walk the high road and trust that the Savior will guide you and bless you more and more and more as you continually stay humble. Uh, just a, an, a powerfully applicable thing that you can put into practice in your own life and in your own family settings today with everything that's going on. Instead of getting frustrated and prideful, we can just become more humble, turn to God, and plead with him to know what he would have us do. Now, Let's go back into the scriptures. So for the sake of time, um, we're not going to go through all of chapter 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 where you see all of these, these people going around that pride cycle over and over again. We're going to cut over to uh, Helaman chapter 13 really quickly and just cover one beginning part of the story of Samuel the Lamanite because I think it will be very, very helpful, very instructive for you in your own life today, facing the struggles and the uncertainty that you're facing. So let's go to Helaman chapter 13. And let me pull that up here. Helaman 13. Here we go. And it came to pass in this year, there was one Samuel a Lamanite. I love the way it introduces him because you have no idea where this guy com comes from. You don't know what his family's like. You don't know who taught him the gospel, who the missionaries were, or if he was born into the church, if he was one of the stripling warriors. Uh, you don't know anything about him. You just know his name is Samuel and he's a Lamanite. And he came into the land of Zarahemla and he began to preach to the people. And they don't like him preaching. So they cast him out and as he was about to return to his own land, you can, you can picture this, this Lamanite walking away from the capital city of the Nephites, feeling a little bit dejected. Verse 3, but behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him that he should return again and prophesy unto the people whatsoever things should come into his heart. I love this because in verse 4, he, he goes and he tries and it came to pass that they would not suffer that he should enter into the city. You can picture how easy it would be to, to be the devil, so to speak, on his shoulder, whispering discouraging words into his ear, thinking, you're a Lamanite, they're Nephites, they hate you, they're biased, they're racist, they, they haven't ever accepted you, why are you following God, he's not helping you, just go home, forget about all of this. All of those negative voices in his head, he completely disregards any attempt to try to dissuade him from fulfilling what God has asked him to do. So you'll notice as he gets rejected from the gate of the city, I can picture him going back and looking, saying, I'm, I'm not going home. I've got to deliver this message that God is going to put into my heart, but I don't know how to do it. And you can picture him kind of looking and thinking, hmm, where there's a wall, there's a way. And he goes and he climbs up. And he gets on that wall and he stretches forth his hand and he begins to teach. And you get chapter 13, 14, 15, 16. 
We're going to be covering some of the teachings of Samuel a little bit later on in our plan of salvation lesson. But I just want to point this out. I cannot find anywhere in scripture a prophet who is more specific in his prophecies than Samuel. As you read through these chapters on your own, just pay attention to how many prophecies and how laser focused those prophecies are. Uh, a, a whole series of those prophecies are associated with the birth of Christ and the signs that will be given here in the Americas in relation to the, the birth experience over in the old world. And he doesn't just tell them, oh yeah, you're going to see heavenly signs. He tells them five years are going to pass and you're going to see a new star. You're going to have a day and a night and a day without any darkness. And you're going to know that now the son of God has been born over in the old world. I love the fact that God is using light to show the coming forth of the son of God as well as then Samuel prophesies a little bit later, a few verses later, about his death, that he said there would be three days of darkness upon the face of the earth when Jesus is crucified over in the old world. Uh, as we move forward in life, pay attention to, to the light that you feel. When you, when you love Jesus, when you love the Lord, when you covenant with him and you keep his commandments, you feel light. He comes into your, to your life more fully. When you reject Christ, when we choose to, to follow that other part of the pride cycle into sin, we feel a decrease of that light and darkness. And you see that beautifully in these symbols that Samuel is prophesying here in chapters 13 through 15, and then the conclusion of that whole experience in 16. Which now leads us into 3 Nephi chapter 1. Because now it's been about five years, and the people have been keeping track. And if you've ever wondered what it would be like to live in a society without religious freedom, read 3 Nephi chapter 1. Because verse 9 tells you that... Uh, the unbelievers had set apart a day that all those who believed in the traditions of Samuel the Lamanite should be put to death, except the sign should come to pass. Uh, that's amazing that these people have gotten to the point in their, in their wickedness where they're saying, we're going to kill you for what you believe. No longer has to do with what you say or, or do or even any of these outward things. It's, it's even... Worse than that, it's what you believe. We're going to put you to death. And they've picked a day on the calendar. Now, Nephi, who's the leader of the group of the believers, he, he knows this day is coming. And he has been praying. And it seems to be the day before or very, very shortly before the day that they're all going to be killed. When notice verse 11 came to pass that Nephi went out and bowed himself down upon the earth, and he cried mightily to his God in behalf of his people, yea, those who were about to be destroyed because of their faith in the tradition of their fathers. And it came to pass that he cried mightily unto the Lord all that day. And behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, and we'll, we'll get that in a minute. I want you to stop and think about this for a minute in your own life. Have you ever had an experience where you wanted something, you wanted it really, really desperately. And, and timing was kind of a, a critical element. And you wanted it now, and it didn't come. And you kept pleading, and you kept pleading, and you kept pleading, and it didn't come, it didn't come, it didn't come. And finally, at the last moment, it came. Why does God do that to people? God knew that he was going to be coming into the world tomorrow. Jesus could have given Nephi the answer at the beginning of the day as he begins to cry mightily unto the Lord. He could have done it at noon or in the early afternoon, but he waited and he allowed this prophet to kneel and plead all that day in behalf of his people. And then finally at the end, the answer came. I can't answer for the Lord. I don't, I don't know why he does that, but I know he does it. I know I've experienced it multiple times where things have been delayed. 
And I am so grateful for a God who knows more than I do. Because if it were up to me, I'd be, I'd be fixing things instantaneously everywhere I go with, Heavenly Father, fix this, fix that, fix this, heal them. Don't let them die. Don't let bad things happen to this person. And we would basically be wiping out the tests of mortality and the trials of our faith, the very things that make us stretch and grow and learn and become. God is refining you. Your, your dross is being consumed as he refines your gold through the process of these, these long struggles. So notice verse 13, lift up your head, Nephi, and be of good cheer. For behold, the time is at hand, and on this night shall the sign be given, and on the morrow come I into the world, to show unto the world that I will fulfill all that which I have caused to be spoken by the mouth of my holy prophets. You guys, I don't know how to say this other than just to say it. You can try to go it alone. You can try to look to the world's experts for what's going to happen in the future and what you need to do to be happy but it's not going to lead you anywhere happy. Uh, God loves his prophets and upholds their words. There's no safety outside of following his living prophets and trusting Jesus as we move forward in that, in faith in him. Now, let's shift over to 3 Nephi 8. So this is where we've now covered 30... 33 years, we're at the end of his life, and he is being uh, crucified in 358. Notice what happens in the Americas. We'll pick it up in verse 5. And it came to pass in the 30 and 4th year, in the first month, on the fourth day of the month, there arose a great storm, such an one as never had been known in all the land. Notice the, the things that it mentions here. There was a great and terrible tempest, terrible thunder, shook the whole earth as if it was about to divide asunder, exceedingly sharp lightnings, such as never been known in all the land. The city of Zarahemla took fire. Moroni sunk into the depths of the sea. There was a mountain and earth was carried up upon the city of Moroni. Huh? You guys, I, I don't know all the details here. I know that a lot of our geology professors on campus, they read 3 Nephi 8, and they see major, major earthquake and volcanic activity. Just for fun, look what happens with volcanoes. They create their own weather patterns. You can just Google volcanic lightning and look at some of the images. Exceedingly sharp lightnings. Volcanoes combined with earthquakes can do everything that we're talking about here uh, shaking the earth, causing cities to be sunk and others buried in the earth. Um, there's a great mountain in the place of Moranaiha. Uh, the whole face of the land is changed and there are terrible tempests and thunderings and lightnings and the quaking of the earth that lasted for three hours. Then in chapter nine, he, he tells the people why he's done what he's done. He tells all these different cities that have been destroyed because he's hiding up their iniquities, their wickedness, that the blood of the saints and the prophets shall not come up anymore against them. They've, they've gone through that cycle too many times in a telestial cycle. And he's saying, okay, now your destruction is, is finalized. You're, you're not going to be allowed to do this anymore on this particular side of the veil. Those who survive, you'll notice, who are they? It's in verse 13. Oh, all ye that are spared, because ye were more righteous than they, will ye not now return unto me and repent of your sins and be converted that I may heal you? You'll notice he doesn't say you're righteous. He just says you're more righteous than the ones that I've destroyed. And he, he pleads with them to repent. But then he says, if you will come unto me, you'll have eternal life. And then he tells them who he is. I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay, now go over to chapter 10. He gives them a lot of opportunities during many hours of darkness. And it's so dark that they can't kindle fire. They can't see anything. 
Uh, they could feel a vapor of darkness in the air, probably something you could describe after, after major tectonic uh, activity and upheaval on the earth with volcanoes and earthquakes. Notice who he then talks to. Verse 3, it came to pass, there came a voice unto the people, and all the people did hear and did witness of it. Who's he talking to in verse 4? Who's his audience? O ye people of these great cities which have fallen, who are descendants of Jacob, yea, who are of the house of Israel, how oft have I gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings and have nourished you? You'll notice in verse 4, everything seems to be past tense. I've done this for you. Now look at verse 5. Looks more like present tense. How oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings? Yea, O ye people of the house of Israel, who have fallen. O ye people of the house of Israel, ye that dwell at Jerusalem, as ye that have fallen. Yea, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens, and ye would not. Who's he talking to? In verse 4, to the people of the great cities which have fallen. Here, you people who have fallen. It looks a little bit like he's talking to people on the other side of the veil. Look at verse 6. O ye house of Israel, whom I have spared. Hmm. Now he's talking to people on this side of the veil. How oft will I gather you as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, if you will re repent and return unto me with full purpose of heart? Looks like he's been talking past tense, present tense, and future tense to people on both sides of the veil, and they're listening. They're paying attention now. Uh, this group that survived, you'll notice Mormon tells us in verse 18, that in the ending of the third and fourth year, behold, I will show unto you that the people of Nephi who were spared, and also those who had been called Lamanites who had been spared, did have great favor, favor shown unto them, and a great Great blessings poured out upon their heads insomuch that soon after the ascension of Christ into heaven, he did truly manifest himself unto them. So now we come into what many have called the Holy of Holies in the Book of Mormon. We've worked our way through incredible wars, through secret combinations, and, and uh, the Gadianton robbers in the first part of chapter of Third Nephi that we haven't even covered, and the last parts of Helaman where it was just awful. Then this incredible upheaval of destruction, and now there's calm, and now Christ is going to come, and they're going to be brought into His presence. Third Nephi eleven is profound on every level. Notice that the people gathered around the temple in the land bountiful, which is up north, and they're showing one another the great and marvelous change which had taken place. I, I would suggest to you that the change which had taken place, they're probably point, pointing to things with buildings and structures in the land, but I think the biggest change that has taken place has nothing to do with bricks and mortar. I think the most great and marvelous change that has taken place has happened inside their hearts. And that's what can happen if you don't follow a pride cycle, but if you follow a humility cycle, a celestial cycle, and choose to be meek and humble uh, rather than, than prideful. So they're also conversing in verse 2 about Jesus Christ. And notice that while they're sitting there, they hear a voice, and it comes out of heaven. It wasn't a harsh voice, neither a loud voice. But here's the problem. They didn't understand the voice. So here's what they did. They cast their eyes round about because they didn't understand the voice. Brothers and sisters, that is, that is so typical of human beings in a fallen world with a, a fallen nature that heaven gives us some answer, some direction, some guidance, something where, where heaven's talking to us and our knee-jerk response is, huh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I, I don't understand what just happened. And so what do we do? We turn horizontally and we look around the, the, the group of people, either literally or electronically. We, we say, hmm, I wonder what the experts in the world say that meant or what I should do or what decisions I should make or how I should live my life. 
and we look horizontally for the answers to things that we should be looking heavenward for. You'll notice as they look horizontally, it's this look of confusion on their face, trying to figure out what they're supposed to do, and they, they don't know. Neither does anybody else, because nobody else understood the voice. And so it doesn't do them any good to do this horizontal uh, seeking. Verse 4, the voice came again, and they still didn't understand it. Now watch what happened in verse 5. Again, the third time they did hear the voice and did open their ears to hear it, and their eyes were toward the sound thereof, and they did look steadfastly towards heaven from whence the sound came. Oh my goodness, that is so applicable to our day. If we could figure out how to unplug a little bit from our, from our social media, I know we're doing a good job of social distancing, but I'm not sure how good of a job we're doing with social media distancing when it comes to things that really matter, elements of, of turning to God and figuring out what to do with our life. But they did that. They turned heavenward, and they're looking steadfastly, and now they understood the voice. And here's what it said. Behold, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have glorified my name, hear ye him. You would think that they, uh, that they understood the voice, right? Because they, they heard what it said. They could decode it. They know what the words are. But notice they understood, then cast their eyes heavenward, and they saw a man descending out of heaven, dressed in a white robe. And as he came down, they're all saying, Shh, don't talk, because they think that it was an angel that had appeared unto them. Apparently, they hadn't fully understood the voice of God, and that's okay. We're not beating them up, and you shouldn't beat yourself up when you, when you don't fully understand what God is telling you. It's line upon line upon line that they're growing, and he's working with them just like he's working with you. So this angel stretched forth his hand and said, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. I love that. Because the moment the people realize who it is that's standing there, nobody runs up to him. Nobody starts cheering. Verse 12, it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, the whole multitude fell to the earth. For they remembered that it had been prophesied among them that Christ should show himself unto them after his ascension into heaven. There have been many, many depictions of 3rd Nephi 11 in film in photography, in art, of, of a variety of media. And often what we see portrayed is Jesus coming into a crowd and this crowd coming around him and, and him holding out his hands and going through the crowd and people just kind of touching as he goes by. It, I get it's a fine interpretation uh, for, for a screen, but in reality, the way that... Uh, Nephi records this story for us, that's not at all accurate. Look at verse 14. Arise and come forth unto me that you may thrust your hands into my side, and also that you may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that you may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and have been slain for the sins of the world. You guys, they already know that this is Jesus, the God of the whole earth, the God of Israel. The Father told them, they saw him descend, they heard him introduce himself, they already know, but he wants them to come forth that ye may know. There are different levels and different degrees of knowing that Jesus is the Christ. I knew that that was true when I went to serve my mission, but when I got on the plane to come home, I knew it was true at a totally different level. I knew that that was true when I first got married, but now, over two decades later, Jesus is, uh, it's more than just knowing that he is real, and that he's the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth. 
It's coming to know his characteristics, his perfections, his attributes, his traits, his, his personality more. I love him more now than I ever have before. He's more real to me now than he ever has been before. And the significance of this for me comes in verse 15. This is my favorite verse of all scripture, all time, anywhere ever written. And it came to pass that the multitude went forth and thrust their hands into his side and did fill the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. And this they did do going forth one by one until they had all gone forth and did see with their eyes, did fill with their hands and did know of a surety and did bear record that it was he of whom it was written by the prophets that should come. You'll notice this was not a group effort. Now the multitude's there. That first line, the multitude went forth and got to have this experience, but they had the experience one by one. That's how Jesus does his work. When they had all gone forth, they all cried out with one accord, saying, Hosanna. Hosanna means, dear God, please save us now. That's, that's an extended way of saying what Hosanna means. It's, it's save now. It's this petition to God. Will you, please, <clears throat> will you please save us? After having had that experience one-on-one -on -one with Jesus Christ, nothing else mattered to these people. They wanted salvation. They wanted to be with him forever. Blessed be the name of the Most High God. And they did fall down at the feet of Jesus and did worship him. Did you notice this? Verse 17, they fell down at his feet. Back in verse 12, it said that when Jesus had introduced himself, that the whole multitude fell to the earth. You have two falls in chapter 11. I don't, I don't have authority to, to say exactly what that means, but in my own mind and, and heart, I sense that the first time they fell to the earth was a reaction to realizing that that's Jesus, the being that was prophesied would come into the world and would, would be crucified and slain for the sins of the world. That's him. And they fell down out of a sense of, of reverence and awe and respect for him. To me, the fall in verse 17 is a lot deeper. It feels more worshipful. It feels more intentional. It feels more, more purposeful. They did fall down at the feet of Jesus and did worship him. I want to finish today's lesson uh, in a, in a non-conventional way, a non-traditional way. I want you to see one artist's depiction of this that happens to be my favorite. Mark Mabry. I called him on the phone this morning to get his permission to share this with you. And uh, he's, he's an amazing saint who said anything that can help bring peace to the world, I'm, I'm free to share. So I appreciate that. I want you to sit back and just relax for a minute and picture what you would experience if you came to Jesus one at a time. If you had an opportunity to come and stand in front of him and he invited you to thrust your hand into his side, um, that's very sacred ground, the, the fact that he's inviting them to, to thrust their hand into his side. We know where that wound goes. And to feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. Picture what you might say to him picture how you might respond. The reason I like this depiction I'm about to show you is because everybody's different. For some people, they, they want to smile and rejoice with Jesus, and he does that with them. For others, they want to be reassured that they're better than they thought they were. For others, they need to be forgiven. For others, they just need to cry, and they need him to cry with them. And I love this particular depiction 
because I think Mark has, has captured that so beautifully with so many people. And I want to just invite you to keep a prayer in your heart as you watch this to, to figure out what you would need the Lord to be for you in that moment. And then don't wait for that moment. Plead for the Lord to come more fully than ever before into your life today to help you, to, to work with you at your level, with your struggles and your constraints and your issues. So enjoy as I stop talking here for a minute and uh, you get to enjoy this movie. So I want to jump in here and finish by telling you a couple of things that I know. I know that Jesus Christ lives. 
I know that he is your savior, your redeemer, and he knows everything that you're going through and everything that you will go through in the future. And he loves you. I want you to know that I know that you are children of heavenly parents who are perfect and they love you and they're watching over you and they will guide and direct you as you turn to them. And I also want you to know that I know that we have a living prophet upon the face of the earth today. And I'm so grateful that the Lord would speak to us through President Russell and Nelson. May the Lord's richest blessings be yours as you move forward through these times of uncertainty and uh, trust in Jesus. Know that you're loved.